Dante asked me to introduce you because I've known you for um, a few years and you were the one that approached me about uh, giving the talk. So I'm very happy to do that. Um, uh, Jakub is a associate professor at Yale University. Um, his research uh, encompasses secure processor architectures, cloud security, FPGA attacks and defenses, and hardware FPGA implementations of cryptographic algorithms. Um, so you've been at Yale since uh, 2013. 2013. I was just trying to find the note. Yeah, time, flies, time flies. Yes, time definitely flies. Uh, before that, you were at um, Princeton, where you got your PhD. And before that, you were at my alma mater, you were at University of Illinois. So um, nice. So today, you're going to be giving a talk on securing FPGA accelerated cloud infrastructures. Um, specifically, you're going to talk about security from the perspective of side and covert channel attacks. And so anxious to hear what you have to say. Please okay, take it away. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks for everybody uh, for coming. And yeah, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to, to speak up or I, I can, I think I can see the chat window. So you can also type in the chat window as well. Yeah. But uh, today I want to talk about our work on um, cloud FPGA security. Uh, but before that, I just thought to give a, a brief introduction and advertisement about the research group and the different topics um, that are kind of we're covering. So today I'll talk about the cloud FPGA security. Uh, so I should, don't have to introduce that much. But in addition, uh, my group also works on implementation of uh, cryptographic algorithms on FPGA. So this is kind of basically instead of attacking the FPGAs, this is using the FPGA as a prototype typing platform and seeing how you can efficiently implement different algorithms. And um, now there's a lot of interest in this post-quantum cryptography and lightweight cryptography, which are sort of new, new standards being developed or part of these efforts to kind of find efficient hardware implementations uh, for these algorithms. And um, also on a, in a, another direction, we're also looking at processor architecture security. So this is kind of, uh, I guess my, my PhD was about uh, processor architecture security. And since then I've kind of moved into more of these um, FPGA work. Uh, and also another another major research direction is work looking at uh, hardware and physical security, especially physically unclonable functions, and kind of looking at how to use the the physical properties of the uh, of the circuits for you know for for security for uh, for defending the the systems and uh, especially the uh, processor architecture security is. is covered in my recent book, so I just want to shamelessly advertise that there's a, there's a book, actually, uh, most universities, you can get a free PDF through the library, so you don't have to buy anything, you can, you can read about uh, processor architecture security, uh, and, and lastly, I just want to advertise that, you know, especially any undergrads um, listening, you know, we're, we're recruiting for our for PhD positions, so if you're interested, you can go to the caslab.csl.el.edu uh, to look at, you know, just let me know if you're interested in applying to kind of looking at any of these um, hardware related uh, security topics. And so, you know, why, 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 why is the research group considering so many different research directions? And then uh, kind of the, the motivation for looking at not just one topic, but uh, a spectrum of topic is that, you know, an attacker only needs to find one weakness in a system. So, so a defender needs to basically defend the whole system, hoping that, you know, he or she kind of covers all the all the all the directions, and if we just focused on one thing, that's for example, say, you know, if we focused on uh, CPU, which is something I did in my in my thesis, then for example, the attacker could use the FPGA accelerator, which is kind of the work I'll talk about today, that could attack the system. So you can't really uh, focus on just one part of the system. Uh, at least for security, you have to cover, um, I believe, a lot of different topics. And so we, you know, we look again at defending of CPU with some recent work on um, on different types of side channels. Uh, a lot of work on FPGA now, which I'll, I'll cover today, uh, also on the devices and circuits with the, with the DRAM fingerprinting and uh, physically uncolumbable functions, uh, for example. Uh, but also, I think there's a very interesting uh, kind of research direction or, or a need to look at security of the, of the infrastructure. So, you know, all these CPUs and FPGAs, they're part of a bigger computer system or bigger, um, you know, data center. And, uh, you know, for example, we're exploring how you know that the PCIe bus or the shared power supply could lead to different information needs. So you need to also consider the um, the infrastructure. And for a lot of these projects, kind of also we kind of publish a lot of open source code. So you can you know I can look on our website for all the all the sample attacks or or different defenses like different verification uh, projects that we did. Um, all right, so uh, jumping into uh, jumping into the main talk. So today I'll talk about. Uh, securing uh, FPGA accelerated uh, cloud infrastructures. Um, for short, we usually call it uh, cloud FPGA security. So this is the idea that you have um, FPGAs which are located uh, in a remote uh, cloud data center. So uh, first I'll, I'll 
I'll start by giving some background on uh, field programmable gate arrays, so the FPGAs, and talk about how they're used in the cloud and what are the uh, different uh, information leak uh, dangers. Uh, then I'll talk about kind of our three, um, three recent projects. So I'll go, uh, go into details on those. And then I'll give sort of one, one, one slide summary at the end. Hopefully there is time about some of our most, most recent ongoing work, including looking at uh, machine learning and how you can sort of leak information from FPG accelerators in, in machine learning uh, and then I'll kind of conclude and, and wrap up the talk and since there's a lot of uh, a lot of different uh, different projects covered in this talk I just kind of want to highlight some of our our contributions overall in, in this area so you know we, we've developed the first uh, temporal thermal uh, covert channels and FPGAs uh, we've demonstrated the first approach for how to you have a cross FPGA communication uh, using the shared power supply and then you know we've developed ways of fingerprinting the FPGAs, which can be also you know, an attack to kind of map the infrastructure, but it could also be a defense for um, basically making sure you're, you're getting access to, to, to do unique instances of the FPGAs. And then you know, more recently, kind of we've uncovered new types of crosstalk in FPGAs or these uh, machine learning uh, attacks that I'll kind of very talk very briefly at the end. So um, I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff already done, but I think there's actually even more uh, to be done since it's kind of an emerging field of you know, FPGA um, cloud security. And so just as a very brief background, I, I think um, everybody may be already familiar with this, but you know, uh, this is an, a, a sort of a, a example of a textbook uh, field programmable gate array where you have a bunch of um, wires routing wires that go across the board that connect different uh, configurable uh, logic blocks. So these, these blue boxes are CLBs. And then, so, so the FPGA chip is basically uh, like an array of these, uh, of these elements that are unconfigured. And then the field programmable part, of course, is that you, know, you can program it uh, with any desired uh, or with a lot of different types of desired uh, digital circuits. And you know, when, you, when you quote program the FPGA, Basically, you're you're setting the you know the connections between these routing wires, and you're setting the contents of these uh, lookup tables to implement the uh, the logic that you want the FPGA to to perform. So the so basically the user user has some hardware design in, in you know Verilog or VHDL, and then the tools map or uh, create a bit stream, and then it's programmed into the FPGA fabric. So you know you might have you know you might be familiar with like a block diagram or some other description of a hardware design, and then the tools map that into the FPGA chip. And then, so the, the main benefit is that if you, know, if you can write the hardware um, description of, of, of different algorithms, uh, oftentimes it's much more efficient than the CPU uh, implementation. And it is a much, you know, much less cost than doing an ASIC, right? So, so ultimately, you know, you'd want to do your algorithm in an ASIC to be the, you know, the fastest and the lowest energy, but an FPGA is sort of like a middle ground where you know, better than CPU and you know, fast, you know, faster turnaround time and much less cost than ASIC. So um, we're kind of focusing on, you know, how can we secure these FPGAs since they're, since they're important uh, type of a, um, you know, accelerator that, that can be used for different algorithms. And now, so now we have the, the FPGAs and then, so what's, what's new with the, with the cloud computing? So basically since uh, three or four years, you can use the FPGAs as part of a, you know, cloud infrastructures where you basically go to Amazon and you, you rent an FPGA, you no longer have to, uh, you know, have your you know have your own FPGA board in the lab. You can just go and rent one. And in the cloud providers, typically again have these FPGAs, which are on FPGA boards, uh, and a bunch of those boards are are in a server. And then you know the cloud provider has bunch of a bunch of servers with the FPGA boards that they rent out to to the user. So there's a so there's, there's a remote user that can basically go and just like with, with regular virtual machines or with GPUs, you basically pay pay by the hour or pay by the minute in in, in some instances. To get access to these FPGAs, and you can really quickly get, you know, large number of FPGAs as you know, as, as you know, as big as your credit card is. That's you know, that's how many FPGAs you can get. And it's, I think, it's actually very, very easy in terms of, you know, they provide all the tools and licenses, so that I think the barrier to entry for people using FPGA accelerators uh, it is much less with the when the FPGAs are in the cloud. And there, you know, I'll, I'll be using Amazon as the main example, but you can see here there's, you know, Microsoft, Alibaba, Huawei, all, all these providers basically have some form of, of FPGA um, services in the, uh, in the cloud. And when we have the FPGAs in the cloud, just to uh, kind of diving a little bit deeper how the servers are architected. So basically you have the FPGA board and you can have a bunch of FPGA boards in a, in a server again. And then, so when we start to think about the security, so you can see that the, 
the FPGAs are you know, uh, individual, but they share some resources within the server. So for example, there is a shared PCIe that goes between the server where the user's software is running and the FPGA's board. So even if you have your own FPGA board, you still have a shared resource such as the uh, PCIe bus. And in addition, there, there are many other shared resources, you know, like the power supply or the cooling. So all of these things are sort of, um, you know, part of the infrastructure that maybe we don't think about when we're just using the, the individual um, FPGA. And of course, you know, all these servers are in server racks. So there's, you know, shared networking, shared power for the whole server rack, you know, cooling things like that. So there's a lot of infrastructure that, um, that that's connected between those servers. So even though you, you get your own FPGA, um, you're sharing that. And uh, in addition to actually just getting your own FPGA, I'll talk a little bit about these multi-tenant a cloud FPGA. So this is a, a more recent idea that you have different users share one FPGA board itself to improve, you know, utilization. But uh, you know, uh, as we and others have shown, that it leads to more, you know, more security, uh, potential security vulnerabilities. Yeah. Can I have a question to ask you before you yeah. go on then about this? So is this also assuming that these FPGA boards are pre-programmed? They're reconfigurable, but they're they're configured ahead of time for a specific use that somebody's doing that maybe it can be you the user for your own private use but also you're also making it available for multiple users to use the fpga yes exactly perfect perfect question so this is i think the very good transition to the threat model so yes so we assume that basically the 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 user can program the fpga with whatever design they want so you go to mm -hmm. amazon and you say hey give me an FPGA board and they give you an FPGA board and you can load uh, with some minimal restrictions. You can load pretty much any hardware design you want. Just like you can, you can go to Amazon and say, hey, run this piece of software for me. Here you're providing the, the, the but code. Can you also say, you know, Amazon provide me with an FPGA board that does this, that does X, like pre-programmed in there too. Yes, yes, you, okay. you could definitely do. So I think uh, that's sort of, um, I think like uh, Microsoft, um, had the catapult project with the Bing search. And I think now for the Azure machine learning services, they sort of, they, uh, they pre-program the FPGA for you and just provide you pre-programmed FPGA. So mm -hmm. the, so the, yeah. they, they have a machine learning algorithm that's kind of ready to go. So uh, in that case, it's easier for the users uh, because they just get a pre-programmed FPGA. Uh, it, but it's a, bit less flexible because you can't choose your own design. You just kind of basically sure. stuck with whatever they give you. Uh, but it's also better for security because you can't program random things like we are trying to do, but you're stuck with whatever they give you. So in, so in this work, uh, kind of, um, I will focus, uh, going back to the question, basically on users being able to program any design they want, while we assume that the FPGA, uh, the cloud provider is trusted. So you know, they're, they're not going to physically try to manipulate the FPGAs or probe or, or steal some information because that their business is to kind of get people to trust them and and, uh, and rent the FPGAs. However, the users could program pretty much anything uh, into the into the FPGA. And that's where the, the threats come from, is that a malicious users can try to leak or steal information by developing malicious circuits inside the FPGA. And, and I'll talk about some of that in, in our project. And there's sort of, again, two use cases where the single tenant is you have two users on different FPGAs. So they don't share the FPGA, but they do share the infrastructure or the multi-tenant setting where they share the same FPGA chip. And um, I think this multi-tenant uh, became popular again, two or three years ago with a number of projects. I think Amorphos was one of the first projects from, from, from a different research group that basically proposed that you can fit in bunch of users here on the right side, you know, squeeze the hardware design and compile them together in the extreme case and you kind of sharing that FPGA fabric among different users. But as you can see there, these different colors are different users and they're, so now they're physically, their wires are physically next to each other. So that can lead to a potential information leaks. And, but even if you don't have the multi-tenant, like I, I'll show even with the single tenant, you have a number of information leaks that, that you need to consider. Uh, all right, so uh, jumping in now to uh, to the main project. So I don't know if there may maybe any questions about sort of the background or the setup of this. Okay, okay. If not, I'll, I'll jump in and feel free to interrupt. So um, I'll talk about three projects. First, I'll, I'll talk about the information leaks through a uh, thermal channel. So this is basically a project that looks at at how the, the thermal state of the FPGA can 
be used to uh, or abused to to leak information. And uh, one of the kind of basic things I, sh I should explain, uh, it's probably probably I know about it already, is a, is a ring oscillator. So so a ring oscillator uh, is is a basic um, basic circuit that has an odd number of um, of inverters in a loop, and it kind of you know the, the loop feeds feeds itself back to itself, and then by you know constantly you know the values in the ring oscillator constantly oscillate as they as they feed back and then the important thing is that the frequency depends uh, on the on the voltage and then the thermal you know and the temperature of the circuit so so the ring oscillator can be basically used as a as a as a temperature or voltage sensor by observing how the the frequency of the ring oscillator changes due to the voltage or or the or the heating uh, and in addition if you have a bunch of free running ring oscillators, basically, you know, the transistors are switching back and forth as fast as possible. So that that creates a lot of dynamic power, which can be used to, um, for example, heat up the heat up the board, or actually can be also used to, you know, drop the voltages. And uh, it's some other groups have shown it for, for voltage related attacks. So, um, so, so, so these ring oscillators, we're, we're kind of using in two ways, one is as a heating array, so again, if you put a bunch of ring oscillators and just turn them on, let them run, there's a lot of dynamic power that's consumed that heats up the, 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 the FPGA in our case. And then on the other hand, you can also use just a single ring oscillator as a sensor. So if you have a, some reference clock um, that, that, you know, that, counts, that counts time, and then you comp you know, in a fixed amount of time, you count the number of ring, ring um, oscillator oscillations, you can get some information about the, the temperature or, or the voltage. So this ring oscillator will kind of keep coming back <laughs> in in the different projects, and then so in this in this in this first project, we looked at basically how you, the the thermal state can be used to send information. So you know, kind of very simple idea: you heat up the FPGA or not to send a one or a zero, and then I know based on our experiments in in the catapult uh, cloud, you know, the users have you know there's a few minutes of time before the FPGA fully cools off, so you can actually transfer the information. So. Here is sort of the, the kind of the setup of, of this information leak is that you know we have a user that rents uh, a number of, of FPGA boards um, and then they sort of you know heat certain of the certain boards up to transmit the information and then there's some time uh, where you know the user logs off and if different user logs on they get assigned an FPGA and if they get assigned the same set of FPGAs basically the, they can program a sensor that this ring oscillator sensor into the FPGA board and they can read the read basically they can't read the temperature, but they can estimate the temperature, and they can, for example, learn that you know certain boards were warmer than the others, and in this case, they decode the information. So here, you know, zero one 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 was the was the information that being sent. So this is sort of so by manipulating the thermal state of the FPGA, and then you know, once a user logs off, another user can log in, and they can you know they can read the, the thermal state to learn the, the information that's being transmitted. And we've shown this for, for a covert channel, but of course this could also be a, a, a low bandwidth side channel as well to kind of learn whether the previous user did a lot of computations uh, or not. And, and this is sort of, this is kind of a little bit of more details of how the, how the ring oscillator sensor works and, and what you get uh, from it when you're kind of measuring the, 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 the temperature. So here on the left, there's sort of the, before time zero, the heaters are, uh, are turned on, so the, so the ring oscillator oscillator counts are low, and then at time zero we we turn off the heaters. So there's a first big jump that's due to the voltage change. So again, a big array of, of ring oscillators not only dissipates power, but you know causes the you know the voltage to be dropped because the um, the, the power supply can't supply enough uh, enough current. So there's a so when you turn it off, there's a there's a jump in the voltage, which you can see here, and then in the zoomed in in the middle. This is sort of the temperature effect. So after time zero, as the board cools off, the temperature slowly, uh, slowly uh, goes down, uh, which means the ring sensor, ring oscillator sensor counts go go up. And uh, as a reference, this is a you know on the on the right side you see the the thermal, um, the actual temperature from the sensor, and this is something that you would not get access to in Amazon. So Amazon doesn't tell you what's the temperature, but you know in lab tests we can, we can of course measure the temperature, so we can correlate, you know, learn what's the correlation between the ring oscillator counts and, and, the, and the temperature. But you can see that from the ring oscillator count, it's clear that the, the temperature is changing over time. And you have, you know, if you have a few minutes, you know, three, four minutes before it returns to kind of stable in, in this case. Um, and then so, so then, so, you know, so we're using this for, for data transmission. So this is a, a, a type of sort of a, um, uh, a, 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 a non-symmetric binary channel where, where you know if you, if you transmit a zero 
you know, there's never an error because if you don't heat an FPGA, it's not going to heat up by itself. But if you try to transmit a one, there's some probability of an error because the FPGA might cool off uh, before the um, you know before you actually were able to read it off. So so we looked at some different um, error correction and then also looked at using you know multiple FPGAs in parallel to transmit multiple bits. And here you can see that you know by by using uh, multiple FPGAs you can get a a few bits bits per second uh, channel between you know between two users and kind of we demonstrated this in the catapult servers in the Texas uh, Advanced Cloud Computing Center. So it's kind of an academic. Uh, version of, of Amazon Cloud where you, where you can rent FPGAs. Um, and so, so yeah, and then, you know, the nice thing or not so nice thing is basically if, if you can rent more FPGAs, you can naturally paralyze and get more bandwidth. So it's really limited just by the number of FPGAs that you can, that you can rent. And, you know, there's a lot of, like I said, you know, there's kind of just initial, you know, all this kind of initial work in the sense that there's a lot of potential, for example, how do you transmit more than one bit per FPGA? Um, you know, how do you kind of monitor the, some of the data center um, effects and different types of cooling on, on, on the boards. So uh, kind of a lot of, a lot of interesting things to be still to be done. Um, all right, so um, I don't know if you guys have any, any questions about the thermal stuff. Um, uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. So, and it's about, it's about the, uh, you know, I see how the mechanism works, but it's about the model of what you're trying to do here. So my understanding is that you need active participation on both the sender and the receiver parts, right? So if there are you know, two users who try to convert, covertly communicate information to each other, but they're both actively participating. This isn't, you know, somebody is spying on somebody else who has their FPGA, you know, their, their circuit deployed on the FPGA. So, um, you know, I'm trying to imagine a real world case where you would want to communicate information in, in this way, because it's, you know, if both the sender and the receiver are set on communicating, you know, this is a very high cost way of sending information, right? Um, so they must really put a very high value on this being covert in, uh, in a way. And it's only covert if nobody else is watching for this, right? Because if Amazon is deploying, you know, some, some, uh, some logic on their PGA that watches for these kind of heating effects, then they would be able to tell that this communication is going on. So could you comment a little bit more on the sort of the, the attack model here, what real world attacks this would represent? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think I think you have very good points. So our, our focus is so here is sort of basically demonstrating a covert channel, which is going to be very very low bandwidth, um, and it's you know it, again you know if, if they base basically it's, I think for, for I mean just in cloud computing security in general it's sort of like a cat and mouse game. You know that the attackers find some new attack, then you kind of find a defense to defend against, it, and then there's a new attack. So um, I think basically you know if if the I as you know as far as we know. For example, Amazon doesn't monitor the temperature so actively, but you know, now that the, you know, the attack is out there, then definitely they should add the defense for it. So it's sort of, um, you know, we, we, want, we want to make sure that people are aware that this is an issue and it has many actually, you know, easy solutions. You know, for example, if you, if you delay the time between the users, you can kind of mitigate this attack very easily. Although then let's say Amazon loses some money because the FPGA is unused for a longer period of time. So this is, uh, um, so this is sort of, Kind of demonstrating that the, the you know the, the cooling, which may not be the first idea, thing to con when considering security, might actually be important. But I, I definitely agree that you know if, if you want to have a high bandwidth channel, then you can use one of our power-based channels, or you know like a CPU cache-based channel for sure is much higher bandwidth. Right, uh, and, and you know just to wrap this up, I'm curious still what what the uh motivation of the attacker is because if you know I can see if I want to steal somebody else's private key by deploying making sure that my FPGA you know shares an F, my code share my circuit shares an FPGA with them but that's not what's happening here the, the the user who's heating the transmitter already has the information right that they they want to communicate so yes. so so I think I think yeah so so I basically I think this is part of our exploration of you know how far you can push the you know, push the thermal channel. So, for example, I, I you know I listed, for example, the 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 one, one more than one bit per, per FPGA. So, you know, uh, in in our work, we sort of got stuck that you know you can't really well, we're, so far we're not able to do more one bit one bit per FPGA because the you know the heat spreads out pretty evenly in the chip. And although there's some work that people showed multiple bits per FPGA, it was in a lab setting where they had a high speed thermal camera, and you know th there was really you know a lot of physical attacks. And but if you consider just remote ones. Um, so 
so far this is kind of the best we can do and, and indeed if you know if that's the best we can do then maybe this is something that's a a, a low priority threat that you know they don't have to be worried about so we're we're not kind of just trying to kind of always break the system but also kind of analyze the security of the, of the whole system and if this is a you know this is the best we can do and this is ends up being a low priority threat then that's that that's actually really good because that means that you know maybe you don't have to buy bigger fans or, or drop the temperature in the data center things become secure yeah. um, i think that the, the interesting part was I, to me was that although it's really low bandwidth it's you can share you know if you rent more fpgas you can kind of magically improve your bandwidth because you just you know pay a few more dollars and you get another fpga so it, you can paralyze this uh, quite a bit I but think, I, I, I think you know Malta's basically is, is wondering about you know like settings in, in real world about cover channels in general like not necessarily you know like how how far like how many bits let's say you can you know uh, you can you can communicate using thermal and you know for this case like basically the model is you know you, the attacker let's say you have a system that you have compartments right? so the attacker has already made you know kind of somehow assumed controls completely one compartment controls completely another compartment maybe it's a sandbox or something like that and they use cover channels so as to communicate information from one compartment to the other so that's the typical use uh, of, exactly. of, for cover for cover channel use in the real world <laughs> right, right. Uh, so i get that but the attacker in order to have something worth communicating they need to already have used some other approach to break into a, a place yeah, yeah, get yeah. the secret and then they're trying to get the secret out to right? totally That's totally, the... totally. Okay, cool. like you need to have already you need to have perhaps complete control at least in this particular case because you're actually inducing some computation in a very specific way that's going to raise yeah. temperature in a particular way. So, yeah, I mean, you control both ends. Yeah, Assuming, I, though, that someone says, uh, you know what, this is kind of compartmentalized and this is compartmentalized, what you could be saying that, yeah, at least you can, I don't know, like transfer some bits here and there. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so uh, one, I mean, one example that we have, which, uh, for, so for example, is basically, you know, if you can think of like Pepsi and Coke. Let's say you know there's an insider in, in Pepsi who wants to leak some information to you know Coke about their secret recipe. So in this case, you know we I, I, pretty much for any covert channel, we assume that you know the insider already has the information and they're just trying to find clever ways to to leak it out. So, but I, I okay. definitely agree that, cool. that you know, the, the the bandwidth is is quite quite low, uh, which could be a good, good or a bad thing depending on <laughs> if you're an attacker on the. Or the defender. So, uh, so maybe to something that's a little bit more, uh, more um, higher bandwidth. Um, although I guess also want you to note that the, the the one aspect of the thermal channel is that the sender and receiver do not have to run concurrently. That's another. So they, you know, they can use, you encode the information. You can pick it up later. In, in this, in this, this work about the shared power supply, uh, you do need to run concurrently, uh, but you do get higher higher bandwidth. But it's a similar. It's a similar idea that you know there's a there's an insider that uh, that has some information and then you see how you could transmit it over in this case a shared power supply. So basically, you can you know we know that in a, in, a, in, a, in a server typically in a server you'd have you know multiple FPGA boards. You'd have some CPU and a GPU, and they're all all sharing at you know a, a 12 volt power supply uh, from the from the from the power supply unit. Uh, and then in addition, you know, on the FPGA or, or on the CPU or GPU, there's some more uh, uh, voltage converters that convert it down to, let's say, one volt for the, for the FPGA core voltage. But in the whole server, you're sharing the, the, the 12 volt. And then so the idea is, can we modulate the, in this case, can we modulate the, uh, the power consumption, which will result in small voltage drops such that, you know, there's some communication between the, uh, between the FPGAs or actually also between the GPU and FPGA or the or the CPU and FPGA. And, and the key part is that there's this, you know, the shared component, which in this case is the uh, is the power supply. And uh, interestingly, again, going back to the ring oscillators, you can use the ring oscillators as a sensor for, for voltage changes. And also you can use a big array of, of, of ring oscillators to again draw, you know, burn a lot of power, which would stress the power supply and then the there will be a small uh, voltage drop. In the, in the shared uh, in the shared 12 volts uh, and then so uh, so in this setup again we have again the sender and the receiver although they're running concurrently and on the on the sender side 
basically you get these, you know, bunch of the transmitter has a bunch of ring oscillators that that turn on to consume a lot of a lot of power, and then they're connected to the shared power supply unit to the sync to the receiver, uh, and then. On the receiver side, we have the receiver uh, ROs, which try to measure uh, the voltage changes. Uh, but also, uh, kind of what we what we what we discovered is that we need to use these stressor ROs to actually stress the local um, uh, voltage uh, voltage regulator. So so remember, there's this you know the 12 volts coming into the FPGA board, but on the FPGA board, it gets stepped down into a one volt before the actual you know before the actual FPGA chip uh, gets gets the gets the one volt. So if there is some small Variations in the 12 volt actually the you know the the DC to DC converter that converts it to one volt it can actually mask some of that so um, so if, if you don't do anything special you know there might be some variation in the 12 volts and the FPGA never actually uh, sees it but what we what we found out is that by having uh, this stressor circuit on the local FPGA it can actually stress the the that you know the DC to DC converter so that it can Actually, you know, any small variations on the on the 12 volt side will actually become, uh, you know, slightly visible on the on the one volt side and can be measured by the RO uh, RO sensor. So it's kind of an interesting way of <laughs> kind of stressing stressing the thing to kind of get more more signal out of the out of the channel. And then so yes, yeah, so we have basically this, these big arrays of senders and then the sensors on the on the side. And then to kind of show you how this um, you know how this can actually uh, you know work in practice and kind of what kind of, uh, you know, uh, transmission rate and uh, we get it. So for example, we can see that here you have the, the accuracy of the channel versus the number of transmitters. So uh, again, you know, kind of makes sense that if you, if the sender FPGA um, is having a bigger, bigger, bigger number of RO arrays, more, more transmitters, uh, the actually the transmission accuracy can, can improve uh, quite a bit. And then I think that the most interesting one is this the stressor graph. So this is on the receiver side. We have these stressors that are basically turned on while you're measuring the the RO sensors to measure the voltage. And you can see that as you turn on uh, a number of stressors, the accuracy uh, be improves. So basically, by you know, uh, there is you know, on one hand you're drawing uh, enough power so that the DC to DC converter uh, kind of can't, can't keep up, and it's you know some small variations on the 12 volt side. Uh, become visible, but then you know, kind of, in, in quite intuitively, if if you stress it too much, then you lose all the signal because then you basically the local board is drawing so much power that that it drops the voltage and and you, and, the, and the sensor is basically sensing just the you know, whatever is happening on the local board. So so this is kind of so there's some you know, and this is going to depend on the FPGA chip and on the on the on the DC to DC converter being used. But there's some sort of a some sort of a sweet spot where a certain number of of stressors. Can actually improve your improve the signal that you're that you're receiving, and and so that's I think that kind of the the, the key the key part. And then uh, further, uh, you know, here you know of course of course if you have more more measurements, then you can increase the, the accuracy. So basically, we can see that by you know by having a, a bunch of stressors on the sender FPGA, uh, you can actually affect the shared power supply, and with enough or with a correct number of of stressors on the receiver side. You can actually recover the the information that is being uh, that is being sent, and then so we kind of uh, developed this on different number of um, uh, of FPGAs, uh, all from the uh, seven series uh, from Vertex. So this is a, a pretty recent FPGAs and with different uh, different uh, power supply units to kind of uh, you know make sure this is not just a one off thing for for a specific power supply unit. And you can see that uh, you know with few a few bits per second. We can get uh, a quite high accuracy, and it's again, it's a it's a low low um, low bandwidth channel, but kind of it's reliable enough to uh, transmit. You know, for example, you know, cryptographic keys. If the insider has some cryptographic keys, they can um, uh, they can transmit those out. And also, you know, kind of uh, as a, as we were working on the project, we realized that again that you, there could be other channels that you know, for example, CPU to FPGA or GPU to FPGA. So kind of. Uh, in this graph, kind of show you that you know if, if you have a big uh, you know, GPU doing a lot of computation again, uh, you can induce uh, a lot of power draw, which will drop the uh, drop the voltages. And then you know for two different types of uh, power supply units, you can see that you're able to transmit some information. So again, that either the GPU is doing a lot of computation um, or not, and then depending on that, the the receiver FPGA can can monitor the voltages and receive you know one bit or or two bit and kind of uh, 
you know, also as maybe, you know, maybe expected, you know, different power supply units um, are behaving you know, a little bit differently. So let's say uh, we didn't look actually into the specific details of these, these, uh, these two PSUs, but, you know, one of the things is, you know, that, uh, you know, maybe different types of um, um, uh, converter circuits or, or, you know, kind of maybe more expensive, <laughs> more fancy PSU can kind of minimize the noise better. So there is some, some, some dependency on the type of the, of the PSU unit. But, but independent of that, you know, we can transmit the information by, by modulating the, the power. And then I think the difference from the, you know, the, the CPU kind of just based cloud computing is you, you can always, you can always uh, create a CPU or a GPU program that, that draws a lot of power. But with CPUs or GPUs, there's no way for you to, to actually sense that because, you know, the cloud providers don't give you access to any interface where the GPU or, or CPU could tell you what's the, you know, what's the voltage. And, and whereas, you know, the cloud FPGAs, because user can program um, pretty much any circuit they want, uh, they, can, they can create these RO sensors that, um, you know, that can monitor the, the voltages. So, 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 you know, having the FPGA ability, low, low level ability to access the FPGA is kind of, kind of critical in, in this, you know, a new type of channel that wouldn't be possible with just uh, CPUs uh, and GPUs. And, you know, and again, so again, it's kind of, you know, some of the first work in, in this area. And then, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of kind of opportunities, you know, for example, how you can, uh, you know, different type of, of PSUs or voltage regulators, how can they affect this? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe we can use better types of sensors. So instead of um, ring oscillators, there's also a, a, a different type of a circuit, which is called the time to digital, digital converter uh, that, 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 that we know that can be used to sense uh, also voltage and, and, and temperature changes. And actually it's a little bit more, more sensitive than uh, ring oscillators. It's, it's more finicky in terms of it's like, it requires more configuration to get it to work on a specific FPGA instance. But once you get it to work, you can, um, you can get better measurements. So for example, you can probably improve the, um, the, you know, the, the, the bandwidth of the channel or the, by having, you know, TDCs instead of bringing oscillators. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of improvements and, and also, you know, thinking about defenses. So for example, you know, you could ban uh, certain types of, you know, you could ban the ring oscillators. So, so the cloud provider, could scan for the for the ring oscillator, and then if you have a circuit with a ring oscillator, they just say you know you can't load it on the FPGA, which would which might seem to kill the the receiver. Um, however, for for some other work, we showed that there are actually many different types of ring oscillators. For example, ones that include um, a a transparent latch or a transparent flip flop in the loop. Which so it's kind of like again like a cat and mouse game. If they ban, ban one type of ring oscillator, you can design a different one that that bypasses those protections, or if they somehow ban all that ring oscillators that was, then you can use a time to digital converter instead. So it's kind of a, um, you know, again, in the end, it's a, it's a cat and mouse game and we're, we're trying to figure out how, how far to push it, uh, you know, and, and what, what, what could the cloud provider do to, to defend themselves? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I, this is kind of a, a quick overview of the, of the power supply based channel. I, I don't know if you guys have any, um, any questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, it's not not much time left. So I'll, I'll jump into the into the third project, which um, is a little bit different, but actually quite quite related, which is on cloud FPGA fingerprinting. So this is basically um, looking into how can you um, identify the, the FPGA instances um, either to to improve the security or to actually create a new attack, such as uh, fingerprinting. You know, the infrastructure. You know, fi finding out how many unique um, FPGAs there are in, in a cloud provider, and and also there's an important application actually to the very first, uh, very first uh, topic I talked about the thermal channels. So um, when we developed the thermal channel, there was a there was a kind of a, a practical issue that if if I rent an FPGA, if, if if a sender rents an FPGA, how do they know? How does the the receiver know that they rented the same FPGA as the sender? And um, you know, Amazon doesn't give you any serial numbers or you can't, you rent an FPGA, but you don't know which one it is. So actually this fingerprinting kind of solves um, one of the practical issues of the first project that by having a unique identifier, the fingerprint for the FPGA, you can actually, you know, the, 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 the sender and receiver can sort of pre-agree on which, which FPGA, which fingerprint they're going to be using to communicate. And then, you know, they can rent, uh, rent the FPGAs um, until they 
you know, they get the right fingerprint and to transmit the information. And then again, rent the FPGAs until you get the same fingerprint to, to receive the information. And we'll, we'll actually, I'll show in this part that uh, there's actually very high probability of being able to rent FPGA of a specific fingerprint, which means that there's some sort of a determinism in the, in the way that the FPGAs are, are allocated, for example, in, in Amazon. But yeah. so- do you mind a quick question? So yes. Um, I'm just trying to understand your threat model here, uh, because if I could, if these people are already in communication, they can already communicate out of bands. Why do they need to communicate through the FPGA? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so again, I, I think it, it, it goes back to the, uh, to the basically to the, um, to the covert, um, covert uh, channel uh, threat model, where basically we have a we have an insider and an outsider, and they, you know, they maybe they pre-agree on some, uh, some information, but uh, you know, they don't, the, at the time, at the time, they don't have the secret. So for example, you know, um, I, you know, I, I get, you know, I agreed, I'll try to communicate with you and then I get hired by Pepsi. And then, you know, once I get hired by Pepsi, I, you know, I can't talk to you anymore. And then, but that, okay. that, that, that's when yeah. I get the, yeah. uh, get the information. That was the part of the talk I missed because of my school daughter. Sorry. No, no Thank worries. You. No, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, Perfect. yeah, you. So the, you have to have some, you know, they pre-agree on something, but at that time they don't have the, the, the the information. So, um, so in this project, we actually also combined some of our work from 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 prior prior research or on DRAM modules uh, on the DRAM memory, and we used the, actually the DRAM pops for fingerprinting the, the FPGA. So, uh, as a as a very quick review, uh, you know, DRAM memory uses capacitors to store to store data, and you know, you write data by charging the capacitors. So, uh, one bit uh, in, a, in a true cell, one bit means that the capacitor is charged, and then slowly the, the charges leak from the capacitors. So normally the DRAM has a refresh to kind of refresh all the, D, uh, all the capacitors. Uh, but if you turn, turn off the DRAM refresh, then after a certain time, the data will flip. So the charges leak and your one becomes a zero. And for two different DRAMs, after the same uh, decay time, what we call a decay time, they'll have a different pattern, which becomes this, uh, this fingerprint. And you know, uh, you know, our, our prior work on, on DRAM puffs, independent, uh, of the FPGAs kind of show that this, you know, this can be uniquely identify uh, different DRAM modules. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's basically a, a unique pattern, just like a, in like a human fingerprint to, uh, to identify the, the modules. And then so by, by, using, uh, by using these DRAM, uh, DRAM paths in the FPGAs, we can basically you know, fingerprint the, the whole cloud FPGA infrastructure to find out how many FPGAs there are, or for example, the thermal channel, have a have a identifier that the sender and the receiver can use to um, to agree upon, um, and then so um, this kind of gives you an idea of how the DRAM modules are are integrated into the into the FPGA in the in the cloud FPGA. So so it's kind of maybe not counterintuitive, but you know we're using the DRAM to fingerprint the the FPGA, and so how how that that works. So basically the idea is that the FPGA is located on this FPGA board that has the physical DRAM modules on the board. So these are different modules than whatever is inside the FPGA server. So each in the, in the server. So each FPGA has its own dedicated set of physical uh, DRAM modules. And then so um, having a sort of a reasonable assumption that the cloud provider doesn't physically go around switching in and out the DRAM modules on the FPGA board. If you can fingerprint the DRAM on the FPGA board, then you're sort of guaranteed that there's a, you know, for, for FPGA chip, you know, FPGA chip 1000 has a certain fingerprint because it's always located on the same board as the as that DRAM. And you know, if you if you have a D, different DRAM fingerprint, you're you know that's going to be on a different um, FPGA. And and actually, we have a little bit of redundancy because each FPGA board has um, at least in, in in Amazon has has four uh, four DRAM chips. Um, actually, this this seems to be pretty standard for for a lot of these uh, FPGA accelerator cards. They they seem kind of a, Seem to have a, a four, four, four modules, usually 64 gigabytes of, of DRAM um, on the board. And then so, so the idea is that again, if we can use this the, the, the DRAM cell decay as, as the as the DRAM path for fingerprinting. And so if we fingerprint these, these modules, we actually fingerprinting uh, the FPGA board. And then so to do that, we have to you know charge the DRAM cells, then we have to disable the decay rate, uh, disable the refresh to let them uh, decay, and then finally. Kind of read back the read back the cells to get this uh, this finger. 
now that the hey, hey, sorry quick question who's you when you say you is it is it the person who's uh, planning to use the um fpga is it or is it the the center that's uh, deciding on the uh, yeah on yes yes so so you here is just just a, just a cloud user so it can be either the the sender or the receiver so um basically the idea is that the user um either the sender or the receiver would have to first collect um or generate these fingerprints to create the database uh, of the of the fingerprints mm -hmm. and then again the sender receiver somehow would would agree on the you know on which fingerprint from that database or or if you is just one person for example you know i, I just want to know how many fpgas does amazon have in the data center then then i just kind of you know rent an fpga fingerprint it add it to my database and again let it go rent a new 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 fpga if i get a new fingerprint i can add it to my database and kind of grow the understanding yeah. of you think so this would be a security protocol but you'd also think that this there would be instances where this information is something that the um the cloud center would not want to give away the unique fingerprint yeah, yes exactly yes yes so, so i think from the from the cloud provider the the main the main issue um uh, well basically you, you can learn let's say how many fpgas uh they have or or like we've we've looked at or we've shown that you, you can sort of estimate the type of allocation algorithm they use based on you know how frequently you can observe the same fpga uh, sorry it's yeah the same fpga fingerprint or the same dram fingerprint so um you know if uh, if the if the if the cloud provider is trying to hide some details about their infrastructure then this is all yeah this is definitely an issue for them as well okay, okay thanks so so it's kind of learning about the internals of the of the, of the cloud cloud infrastructure and uh, and again, so Amazon does not give you any access to the FPGA identifiers. Um, the, 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 the FPGAs are from Xilinx, and Xilinx does provide this uh, e-fuse, or, or there is sort of like a serial number associated with each FPGA, but uh, you know th th that that's not enabled in the Amazon FPGA. So they're trying to kind of hide the uh, hide the fingerprints. Um, and then, so so I think the crux of the of this fingerprinting is those: how do you get the DRAMs to disable to be disabled? In, in a sense to disable the refresh rate uh, and so the idea is that you know if, if you want to use a dram the fpga there's a there's a soft um, dram controller on the fpga but it's an ip module from xilinx and you can sort of uh, freely enable and disable the refresh rate on, on that so, so if you're using the dram basically the refresh rate is always turned on and it seems like there will be no way to uh to disable the refresh rate to the, the dram cells uh decay so so to overcome that we actually I found a found a workaround, which is basically you have two um, FPGA uh, designs. So you rent an FPGA, but once you rent an FPGA, you're free to load and unload uh, any FPGA design as you wish. So you you you, you once you rent an FPGA, you're holding uh, the same FPGA, uh, you, of course, because you're paying for it. So there, you know, you, you you have access to it, but you can load different uh, AFI. So AFI is is the Amazon's name for the for the FPGA bitstream. And then, so the idea is that you can load AFI zero that initializes the DRAM with some data, and then you load AFI one, which actually is a is a FPGA design without a DRAM controller. And it so happens that uh, if you don't initialize the DRAM controller, of course, the DRAM chips do not receive the refresh commands, so the DRAM is not refreshed. But the whole FPGA board remains powered on, so the DRAM, um, you know. Uh, it's sort of you know it, it's keeping its its data uh, while it's decaying so the DRAM doesn't sort of fully shut down and then so then after a while you can load another you can load the AFI zero again which does have the DRAM controller and it starts issuing the refresh rates and you can issue the read commands to read the read the data back so this is sort of a a, a kind of a, a a clever trick to get sort of this DRAM to stay powered on but disable the refresh rate so that the, the bits can decay and you expose the expose the fingerprint and basically this approach works on three of the four DRAM chips so um, I, I can go back into the details later but basically one of the DRAMs is controlled by what's called a shell which is part of the FPGA that's controlled by Amazon but the other three DRAMs A, B and D are controlled by the user logic so you can have basically you can have you know you can fingerprint three three DRAM modules which actually gives some sort of a redundancy that you actually have three fingerprints that match to one, a match to one FPGA chip, um, and then so this is sort of this was the first uh, you know approach to, to fingerprinting the 
um, the remote FPGAs using DRAMs. And um, as part of the fingerprinting, we, we develop or we develop, we found that there's this very nice Jacquard index metrics metric that can be used for um, for distinguishing DRAM paths. And then so you can have a you can have the inter and intra device a Jacquard index. So basically, uh, if 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 the if the path if the path measurement is from the same device, it's not going to be identical each time, but it's you know it majority of the bits that flip will be in the same location, so the Jacquard index will be you know close to one. And if if you have two DRAM path measurements from different boards, um, you know even if they have the same decay rate, the location is totally unique, and then the Jacquard index comes out to close to zero. So you can by comparing the Jacquard index between different path measurements, you can figure out whether you're you're actually more very likely using a FPGA you've seen before, or if it's a, a totally different FPGA. So this Jacquard index uh, actually it works much better than uh, than the Hamming Hamming distance, which would be a, a typical metric for other types of of, of paths. Could, and, could you say a little bit about the point sixes? I, I, I'm trying to understand that these is this like just noise and measurement between devices, or is it like some devices tend to give you much more closer to point one, and some devices give you much closer to point uh, six? Yes, good. So, so this 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 um, this this index is this is a similarity of two measurements. Right, it's a set. So it's, it's a set similarity. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So. Um, you know, um, there there are a lot of things. So so some devices, maybe the manufacturing variations are more. Um, maybe when you know uh, when you measure the device now and you measure it an hour later, maybe they change the cooling and the FPGA cools a little bit more. So so because the, the 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 DRAM decay is affected by temperature. So you know if, if there's some fluctuations in the data center temperature, uh, th that might affect, give you slightly different measurement. Um, so this this would be you know temperature, some voltage changes. And and some DRAMs might by you know some cells might be just more prone to 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 decay. Um, so actually actually I'll, I'll come back to the temperature thing in, in a little bit, but that's how you somehow it's sometimes it's you know can get 0.6. But but it, the nice thing is you can actually separate it quite quite cleanly. Um, and then so for example uh, we talked a little bit about mapping the uh, the infrastructure. So you kind of learn the we kind of we can learn the probability of getting the same FPGA over time. So we can see that. You know, if here on this graph you can see there, there are different actually different types of FPGA instances. I, I can also talk about that offline, but you can see that you know if you if you rent an FPGA and then uh, of a certain you know size, and then if you come back you know two or or four or six hours later, what's the probability of getting th the same fingerprint again? And we can we can actually see that you know for for different instances. Um, it's almost fifty percent that you can land on the same FPGA as you did before. So it might kind of might indicate that you know uh, maybe the four X instances are are less popular. Um, so you so you're likely to get the same fingerprint, or or maybe they have fewer of them. So they're, when you're assigned the board, you're more, you're more likely to end up on the same board. So uh, this kind of kind of interesting. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know because of the high probability, you know you end up often getting the same board you've seen before. So it makes fingerprinting the whole data center difficult because you would have to be renting for a lot of time to actually get a bunch of new, new unique, uh, unique fingerprints. Uh, and then going back to, to the temperature related, uh, perhaps questions that, for example, again, like I mentioned, the bad thing could be that the temperature affects the decay, but that also means that you can use the DRAM as a temperature monitor for the data center. So you can you can see this is some some measurements we did over a number of of of, of days, uh, two, two or three days, that you can see that the um, the you know, this this is a the same FP. So basically, rent one FPGA for a few days, and keep measuring it every every few minutes. And you can see that the dif different D DRAMs within that one FPGA. So again, there are three DRAMs. They have different number of of bit, bit flips, but the pattern is the same. You know, as there is some fluctuation, uh, most likely in temperature. You can see over time there there are some changes. So you get some insights, perhaps you know, into the the workings of the data center, and not just you know that kind of another another type of information. Uh, but, but you know, again, it's kind of you know one of the first works on on, on fingerprinting FPGA. So uh, uh, you know, there's you know other other kind of interesting things. I think one of the interesting things would be that the future DRAM or uh, future um, uh, FPGA chips from Xilinx, for example, have the 3D stacked a high bandwidth memory on. So the DRAM is on the FPGA chip. So is there some new behavior, or or can you leak some information um, between the the DRAM and the FPGA chip, for example, because it's stacked? So it's kind of 
um, you know, once those become available in the data centers, it'd be kind of interesting to see what you can what you can do remotely. Uh, so I think that, uh, and of course, yeah, and of course, there are other types of puffs. So so the so actually the ring oscillators themselves can be used for puffs. So other groups have kind of explored that, but you know, other ways of you know, if 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 they block the DRAM uh, uh, fingerprinting method, you can find other puffs. I'm sure to kind of do that do the same thing. Uh, yeah, so I didn't know if, if there are any questions. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm running a little bit out of time. So maybe I'll, I'll skip the <laughs> ongoing work. Actually, I had one slide each. Uh, I just can kind of highlight, you know, we've, we've looked at also at, at crosstalk between the wires. So this is for the multi-tenant FPGA setting. Um, our, our most recent project looks at kind of using the power measurements on the, on the FPGA to extract some information from machine learning accelerators. So again, in a multi-tenant setting, you have a machine learning um, inference running on part of the FPGA, and there is a malicious user co-located on that same FPGA, and they can use, uh, in this case, the time to digital converter to measure the power changes as the ML uh, inference runs. And then, for example, they can get an estimate of, of the input to that, uh, to that, uh, to the ML algorithm. So it's kind of a, um, you know, you know, in, in the multi-tenant setting, it can be kind of dangerous when you, you know, different users are able to leak information from each other, such as the, such as the inputs. Uh, and then uh, also, you know, some of this work we've we've discussed with with Amazon security team. So I, I haven't covered our most recent work, but you know, perhaps next time where <laughs> once kind of we clear things out, we can talk about some real, you know, more real uh, cross tenant information leaks, which you know, have much higher bandwidth than, than kind of I've presented here. So um, so with that, um, I kind of I thought just to kind of wrap up, so I can you know answer some questions. But I kind of want to conclude with the fact that you know there's a, a need for for more research in cloud FPGAs and security, given all these potential attacks. And you know, now we need to come up with the defenses. So we, we don't just want to keep attacking things, but actually protect uh, the cloud F, uh, infrastructures. So that's part of why we're kind of working with Amazon as well. Um, I also kind of want to kind of highlight a, an interesting part that maybe, you know, I call like, you know, science and engineering of security is that, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about cloud computing and, you know, uh, virtual machines, FPGAs, things like that. But all of this kind of is, it gets back to very basic, you know, you know, science or engineering, uh, you know, engineering concepts such as you know, capacitive wire crosstalk or or thermal effects on transistors or or capacitor decay over time. So these are like very basic, um, you know, electrical engineering kind of topics. I would say that we're sort of kind of you know using for the security. So so even though it might be talking about security and cloud computing, some somehow it goes back to some very basic. Um, ba basic, basic things, even like you know, power distribution uh, design, unit design, kind of a you know, electrical engineering concept. So um, a lot of kind of basic science and engineering behind these kind of security attacks. And I think the the takeaway message is that you know, this low level access to the FPGA hardware uh, gives attackers chance to create a range of malicious circuits, which they couldn't do with CPU or GPU based cloud computing, and then that can be abused to either their you know, leak or, or transmit uh, information covertly in, in cloud FPGA. So, so with that, thank you so much. Uh, so I wanted to um, acknowledge um, our students and collaborators, uh, especially with UMass, we're working on the machine learning um, aspect of the, of, the, of the security. So, uh, so with that, uh, thanks again, and uh, you know, happy, happy to, take, to take any questions. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jakob. Um, let's see if there's any questions. I think a bunch of people had to run, um, but you know now is your chance to ask any remaining questions. I have a I have a question, but I I, I want to make sure the students don't have any because I want to give them the first dibs. I see they're leaving. Um, yeah, that's right. Kind of, that's okay. Kind of so a little bit one's, a, one's a comment and one's a question. Comment. So based on you know science and engineering of security, I think this is a call to say, hey, you computer scientists, don't forget to learn a little bit about yes, how yes, we're yes, 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 so you understand what you're doing um, better or the consequences of what you may be doing later. Um, but my other question, my. my I guess my question for you then, not comment, the question for you is I, in thinking back of what you're doing with the, the DRAMs and, and um, trying to fingerprint them and so on. You did this for an FPGA, but couldn't you apply this also to um, ASIC designs? Why specifically FPGAs? 
Uh, very good. Yeah, yeah. So you can actually the, the DRAM paths and DRAM fingerprints um, have been, um, you know, we, we explored it and actually other people also explored it in other like, you know, the CPU setting. Um, I think the, um, the, the one interesting aspect or, or is that in, if you, if you have a, the DRAM path in a, in, a, in a CPU setting, you have to usually be a privileged user to disable the refresh rate. So, uh, mm -hmm. so a DRAM path type of attack, uh, it's feasible but it's less practical because you, you have to be the super user or the, the Linux kernel can manage it. Whereas with the, with the FPGAs, uh, you know, since the user can, con, you know, control the, the, the DRAM, um, you know, the, the, the memory controller, they can, they can, you know, they don't need any privileges, which, which goes back to the, you know, so what's the obvious defense? Well, obvious defense is like, give them for, yeah. <laughs> re remove that privilege or force, force users to always have, you know, the, the DRAM controller enabled. Um, so that's, um, yeah, so I think a, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these, I think go back to the low level access is that you, you know, um, for, for, for example, you know, in a CPU or a, or a GPU, you don't have access you know, or, or in a cloud setting, you don't have access to the, to the performance counters that tell you about the, for example, the power usage. So in the, 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 the difference for the FPGA is that you can sort of create this, you know, voltage or, or, or or thermal sensor using the ring oscillators, which is basically like a performance counter. So the, um, I, I think that that's kind of a, that also the issue that a lot of these things could somehow be done in the in the CPU or GPU world. But for example, for for cloud computing, the you know again you don't have the hypervisor privileges to read the performance counters or, or disable the DRAM memory. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, oh, cool. Very thank enjoyable. So um, very nice to wrap up our. Oh, sorry, Connor, did you have a question? Or were you no, just I didn't have a question. I was just saying thank you. This is absolutely terrifying to me. So I'm really happy to, <laughs> <laughs> to see this. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, th thanks guys for organizing this. this and, you know, m hopefully, you know, hopefully next time I can see you here in person, can <laughs> kind of come, come give a talk. It'll be, it'll be really cool to hear. About yeah, that's great. Yeah, I actually, Jacob, I, I um, was planning yeah. to email you as later, so we can uh, try to trade off, and I'd love to. Yes, yes, I, I actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did, I did get your message about. I think, uh, yeah, I, the spring semester is pretty open right now, so we'll right. we'll, we'll find have a, time. Have a we'll okay. have a trade and <laughs> we'll yeah. fix. It. Yeah, great. Cool. All, All right, right. Thanks, thanks, Jacob, thanks for so rounding much. out Thank our you. semester with yeah. this fantastic right. talk, and happy hey. holidays. Right. Yeah, happy holidays. Bye, Stay everybody. safe. Bye bye. See you guys. Bye.